My uncle told me that he was speaking with a classmate when he went to his 50th high school reunion who said, you know, when I heard about feminists, I thought, your mother was a feminist. She believed she could do anything. And she had incredible energy, and she had strong principles. In fact, there was a, a man who was down on his luck, she would say, who would come to her periodically and offer to walk her dog, Mac. One day, Grandma got a call from a friend saying, I just saw old man Letourneau take your dog, Mac, into the tavern. <laughs> Grandma met that old man Letourneau at the door and said, listen here. This dog is a fine Christian dog. <laughs> and you are not to take him into any taverns. <laughs> so she taught her strong principles not only to her children, but also to her dog. I want you to think about some of those traits that I've just described in my grandmother and traits that you think of for women that uh, tend to be stronger in women than in men. And a little bit later on, I'll ask you to just share, shout out some of those traits with us. But right now, I want to talk about the change in the political landscape for people running for office. There has been a huge increase in women running for office. In fact, when I was reading up about it, some people were starting to call it Year of the Woman, but that name was already taken. That was in 1992. It was labeled the Year of the Woman. Following those Senate Judiciary Committee um, hearings for Clarence Thomas, when women watched on TV the way Anita Hill was being grilled by an all-white, all-male Senate Judiciary Committee. And following that, the number of women in Congress doubled in 92. Now, Amy Klobuchar, senator from Minnesota, counted up the number of men who have served in the U.S. Senate since it first began. And she says more than 1,900 men have served there and 52 women, 22 of whom are serving now. We've got a ways to go. When I joined WAND, I thought WAND really encourages women to move up to higher office. We have WILL, which is women's legislative lobby, um, working with women who are in state legislators, le le legislators, <laughs> in, in the houses and senates of the state. <laughs> and, um, we work with them, encouraging them to move up and try for office in Congress and support them in many ways. So when I first joined WAN, I thought that that was primarily an issue of equity. If we've got half the population or more that's women, shouldn't we have at least half of our elected officials women? What I am learning and have learned in even greater degree recently is that women bring more than equal representation when they come to the tables of power. They bring traits that are particular to women and it makes a huge difference. So if you've been thinking about some of those traits, just call out something that you've thought of that you think women are in particular better at? Compassion. Compassion. Care. Care. Mm -hmm. Nurturing. Nurturing. Objectivity. What was that? Objectivity. 
Objectivity. I didn't hear that one. Organizing. Organizing. <laughs> Listening. <laughs> That's right, gumption. <laughs> well, I just keep asking. <laughs> Communication. Um, we talk about issues, men talk about sports, or, you know, something else. Uh huh. <laughs> Communication, yeah. We often, we often meet in smaller community groups, women's groups, and in fact, it was women on the farms and ranches around Hanford who were meeting in their kitchens together and saying, what's happened to the health of our community? We used to be so healthy. And then they started to document the number of miscarriages, the amount of cancer that was occurring. And that was when they began to realize that whatever that was that was going on at Hanford is having an impact on our health. That was true also around um, the Las Vegas test, the uh, Nevada test sites, that um, one woman in particular began to realize and document on a map how many incidents of cancer, and when she realized miscarriages as well, that became documented. People thought she was crazy. We're used to that. She just <laughs> kept it up. And in fact, a play has been written called Exposed, which we will be reading on um, August 5th, a Sunday, in a presentation this summer, just before the Hiroshima Nagasaki commemoration on Monday the 6th. It will be August 5th, Sunday, I think it's from 2 to 5, and um, at Tsunami Books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I attributed, we're attributing this surge of women uh, deciding to run for office, most of us, to the Trump effect. When we saw the kind of misogyny and cruelty that was part of that campaign. Women saw it and said, I've got to do something about that. We've got to change that. But it's also true that the fact that Hillary was running, when women see other women run for office, they have a very positive Me Too kind of response. Hey, I can do that too. And so the com combination of Hillary running and the Trump effect has really caused a surge. In fact, there are 476 women running for the House of Representatives. And in Oklahoma, there are four times as many women for the, running for the legislature there than ran in 2012 four times as many. Women are running for governor, they're running for state office throughout the states. And some of them say they aren't going to measure what they have done by whether or not they win, because they see benefit in the fact that they are tilting the debate more left, more towards progressive uh, responses, and they are laying the groundwork to run again if they don't make it, or they are laying the groundwork to share that information with other women when they run. So, in 2000, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution called Resolution 1325. It's known as Women, Peace, and Security. And in October of 
2017, Trump actually signed the U.S. Women, Peace, and Security Act of 2017 into law. It requires that women be included in uh, peace discussions and peace treaties in areas of conflict and be part of the police and security forces in those areas. It requires there be a strategy to increase participation by women, and it's a global movement. Juan, several years ago, participated in a, what was called East-West Initiative. We have over 700 women state legislators who we work with in Will. And some of those decided they would like to connect with parliamentarians, women from other countries, and share the difficulties and the successes they were having as legislators. And so that took place in several meetings between U.S. women legislators and women from, do you remember some of the countries at well, there were so many, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, I think Syria, Morocco? There were a number of women who connected and met and shared that, their um, experience together. So, um, what we have learned from that, and um, my friend Karen Jacob is married to David Courtright. He is um, director of Croc Institute for Peace Studies. Croc, as in Joanne Croc of McDonald fame. Um, and that institute is at Notre Dame. They have been tracking peace accords for a number of years now. They put uh, uh, team on the ground who monitor the items of the peace accord to see whether or not they're being followed if they're successful. There's been a team in Colombia for several years now and Colombia had conflict that went on for decades. They are monitoring it there. And what we have discovered from their work and also from the Council on Foreign Relations is when women are involved in peace negotiations, 64% less likely to fail if women have been part of that negotiation. And 35% more likely to last at least 15 years. Mm -hmm. The Accord in Colombia, David tells me, has stopped the killing between forces that were part of that conflict. It allows people to move from one area of the country to another without fear. The problem they're finding is in changing from uh, production that was primarily geared to drugs, to illegal, to illegal substances, to uh, family farms. Even though there was part of that accord was about um, re access to the land for those in poverty and for the indigenous groups. Now, do you think perhaps it was women working on that accord that included something like that as part of the need to bring peace? But they're finding that even with a huge number of uh, police monitoring in the rural areas, they need more. And if they're following UN Resolution 1325, they will have women involved in policing um, and the security there. 
So why does that change the peace accord when we involve women? Um, they've decided there are six um, specific traits. Women work across lines. In fact, Israeli and Palestinian women have been working in coalitions for years. And they work to access basic services. They also are, are the, that's where women in black originated. Women who stand in vigil, dressed in black. I think in Jerusalem and, and elsewhere. So women work across lines. Women are also more likely seen as honest brokers. That's because we're generally outside of the power structure. So we aren't as suspect. In Northern Ireland, women were able to work to set up back channel connections between the forces in order to work through problems. There was too much distrust for it to be done without them working behind the scenes. Women are able to stage mass action. Let me just mention the Women's March. And that brings pressure. That was also true for Lema Gabwe, as you mentioned, in, in Liberia. She was able to assemble a number of women for mass action to continue putting pressure there. Women have access to critical information. In Af Afghanistan, women in a small community noticed that the Taliban, Taliban was bringing in, smuggling a number of weapons, and they actually reported it to authorities who ignored them. And a local jail was then um, uh, raided, accosted, and so those authorities should have listened to the women. <coughs> women also broadened the agenda beyond military action and ceasefire. They see that to bring peace, it means far more than just stopping the firing of guns and weapons. And so in Colombia, the peace accord included rights for women and girls written into the accord. It included um, surveillance and looking for gender-based violence, which is often part of war. It's very much a part of war. And access to property, as I mentioned, for rural and indigenous people. And it required that women participate in the politics of Colombia. And the sixth one is aiding post-conflict recovery. Directing money to reconstruct public institutions and services schools, hospitals, establishing clean water, and a judicial system following a nation following the rule of law. So what they have found is that some countries actually have a quota of how many women should be represented in their um, political offices. And what we have found is that when women enter politics, governments change spending priorities. <laughs> so when the countries implement quotas, the annual budget data followed by the World Bank shows that 
from 1995 to 2012, women doubled in those nations that they looked at in, in, in elected office. And where that happened, spending went more towards public health and diminished in military spending. Which leads us to the federal budget here. <laughs> it has been an issue of wand and will for years and years. WAND began as a women's action for nuclear disarmament. And when the Cold War ended, um, we thought, OK, we'll get rid of those absurd weapons. And um, we kind of shifted our focus to our spending priorities here. And we've been talking about it ever since. When I began um, con my connections to WAND, working with WAND, um, I, I started looking at that budget. And I can tell you that it is a bipartisan issue our priorities. Um, the amount of spending for the military has been essentially in the same ballpark in the 17 years that I've been looking at it. And I also want you to know that it's possible to still support our troops, but question our military budget. When I've made this presentation sometimes before, people think that I am abandoning our troops, and I'm not. And we can talk more about that as I roll out the budget banner. So this is the federal discretionary budget for 2019. It's the proposal that President Trump has sent to Congress. Would you and what discretionary means? Discretionary means that Congress has a say in how it's spent, which means we have a say in how it's spent. There is also a mandatory spending budget. That includes interest on the debt. It includes Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, some uh, veterans' benefits are included in that, and that can only be changed by law. So um, the uh, measure here is 6.5 billion per inch, with a B billion. I carefully measured this anytime I make it, and I can tell you that. It's accurate within a billion, two, three, <laughs> something like that. So this first portion is the Pentagon budget, and it is proposed by President Trump at $727 billion. And it represents 61% of this discretionary budget. This is a jump from any other year I've looked at it. Generally, we're at 52 to 54, 55, 56%. It's a huge jump. Um, actually, Congress increased the pay and benefits for our troops this year. So that is part of the increase. Um, however, a whole lot of the money in the Pentagon budget is, is our weapons contracts and all of the money that goes to those. Um, the second portion is veterans' benefits. And that has also had an increase from um, what I'm accustomed to in doing these. Veterans' benefits has moved up to second place in the size of budget categories. It used to be about fourth. 
And prior to that, it wasn't listed separately. It began to be listed separately after we had the kind of scandal that occurred as our Iraq veterans were coming back so grievously injured and Walter Reed Hospital was not taking care of them. Congre there was a uh, holler from our citizens about that and Congress responded and devoted more money to them. This is an example of supporting the troops. It would be nice if we didn't have so much impact from our policy of war on, on our people's lives and health. But that is an example of supporting the troops. What percentage is that, Susan? Uh, seven percent. Seven. Seven, this is. And since you, we can consider it a cost of war, if you add it to 61 percent, we're at 68 percent of this discretionary budget going to our support for militarism and war. And next is government spending at 6%. That represents all federal properties and employees. So that federal courthouse, where you may go to meet and rally, Airstream trailer, yes. <laughs> that's paid for out of this part of the budget, as well as national parks, courts. Smithsonian Institute, and our diplomatic corps, which we know has not been filled under this administration. So that's probably a reason why they felt this portion of the budget could be cut. In fact, it's only these first two portions that were increased. Everything else was cut in this proposal. And for the first time, education has sunk to the fourth position on this budget line. And what was the government percentage? Government was six, six percent, and education is five percent. By the way, there's a pie graph handout up on our wand table if you want to pick one up later that has those percentages. Education covers Head Start, K-12, community colleges, state universities, Pell Grants, lunch program, after school programs. That's a lot to cover. It's diminishing because under Betsy DeVos, she's trying to privatize education more and more. Next is housing and community, which is also at 5%. That includes community block grants, low-cost housing, urban development, and Ruth will tell us those funds are not available for places like... They've cut the taxes. I mean, they've cut the money going. Yeah, yeah. Dramatically cut. So, so that is obviously um, one of those areas where there are programs we're concerned about. Health is at 5%. That includes Center for Disease Control, where we might work on the opioid crisis and do research. I believe research on gun violence, if we were allowed to do it, would be here. And then we get into five categories that are at 2% each. Uh, transportation. Peter DeFazio is head of the House, uh, minority leader of the House Transportation Committee. Um, he is very concerned about the condition of our bridges, uh, the support for Amtrak. Those rails could maybe use some work, it sounds, seems like. Infrastructure falls into that. Say that again. Infrastructure. Infrastructure, yes. Uh huh. I'll mention that, yes. Um, international affairs, embassies, um, 
actually international affairs includes international aid, which includes weaponry that we send to the highest receiver of weaponry is Israel of our uh, weapons. What was that? Followed by Saudi Arabia. But, yeah, I think so. Um, energy and environment is way down here at 2%. And um, I think they figured they could reduce that because Scott Pruitt is eliminating regulations for Environmental Protection Agency. Science, um, support for science and research. And um, labor includes unemployment. And so helping those who are unemployed to um, uh, get jobs is part of that. And at the very end, 1% food. That includes the, that SNAP program, what used to be food stamps that we're being told has to be cut. Um, unfortunately, it also includes the large farm subsidies that um, are not that helpful to small farms. Did you say unfortunately? Who, who was that? The, the large um, commercial farms, the huge, yeah, they, they get, suck up a lot of the money and get a lot of, um, su yeah, you got, no, no, I don't, yeah, yeah. Um, I should also let you know that the Pentagon has never passed an audit. In fact, they've quit trying, although um, Wyden has been on that, trying to get that to happen. Congress actually passed a law that said you don't, the Pentagon doesn't have to pass an audit because they can't. <laughs> and the Pentagon did an internal um, examination of their spending to check for waste. And, and to try and figure out where the money was going. Um, they discovered $125 billion in wasteful spending. So they promptly tried to bury that information so that we wouldn't know about it because it's important that to the Pentagon that the money keep rolling in. So, if there was someone else who could hold up this end, or, okay, we got enough tension on that. Yeah, yeah. You may, you may have heard about an effort to modernize our nuclear um, arsenal. arsenal. That came under Obama, actually, when we were neg when we were trying to get Congress to pass the New Start law, and and they did pass it finally. It was a battle. Um, oh, maybe there's time for me to tell you a quick story about Georgia Wand. They're a powerful group. They were trying to get a um, an appointment with Johnny Isaacson, uh, who is. Senator, and um, they just could not get him to meet with them because they wanted to talk about New Start. Finally, um, they got a call from the office saying, uh, Senator Isaacson is willing to do a photo op with you. <laughs> so they said, okay, fine. And Bobby Paul, who was chair of Georgia Wand at that point, had done her research. As she stood next to him for the photo, she said, you know, Senator, your church, the Methodist church, is really opposed to nuclear weapons. He said, they are? She said, oh, yes. In, in fact, if you checked the website, you would see that it's prominent. As soon as the 
photography was over. He went to his computer. Bobby Paul gave him the web address. And he looked and boing, first home page, abolish nuclear weapons. Um, he voted to get that bill out of committee. Wow. And it was a strategic point when it got out of committee finally and could be voted on. Unfortunately, the trade-off in those negotiations was an agreement to modernize our nuclear triad. And that involves the delivery systems, land, air, and submarine. And now that we're looking at what that means financially, it's in up to a trillion over 30 years. Um, it's re we've recruit oh, and then Trump nuclear posture review uh, just came out this year, and they want to develop several new nuclear weapons, uh, smaller strategic ones, which means usable. I'll let that pause and ring through your ears for a while. So the, this Trump budget recommends an 11% increase in nuclear spending and a decrease in non-proliferation work. In fact, over 10 years, this uh, policy of modernization would amount to $400 billion. And so for one year, on this scale, it would be about six inches, which doesn't look like all that much in this sea of red. But it starts to look like a lot more if, for instance, we were going to add it to that food budget and SNAP program. If we were going, any one of these 2%, how about adding it to environment and address the issues of global warming? How about adding it or a portion of it to transportation to create mass transit that would be efficient and work well and would reduce our carbon emissions? We could always add it to health. We can certainly add some to education. Or how about some of those forces for uh, diplomacy? So that is the cost of our nuclear program. And it's the cost of our militarized budget. We have a new national director at WAND. She says, WAND sits at the intersection of denuclearization and feminist leadership at a time when these two movements are gaining momentum and feeding each other's growth. She is so excited to continue working with our team at WAND to ensure that women's voices are at the tables of power and the threat of nuclear war is eliminated. That's it.